Scientist. Um, Dr. Reese have, was the lead author on one of the uh, articles on superchondro humerus fractures. <laughs> and then um, we uh, also had a uh, publication from Metric, which was uh, in that list of uh, top 20. So uh, really happy to, um, uh, to see that from our team here. And um, Really uh, proud of the accomplishments of everybody uh, and that they continue to put out. Uh, CME color for this morning is going to be green. And um, since we're running a little late, I'm going to get rolling and uh, ask Dr. Turk to come up, who's going to talk to us about knee dislocations. Dr. Turk. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rob Turk, I'm a second year resident. I'll be discussing uh, knee dislocations. Good to bad and this morning. Um, sorry for the delays, try to get through everything and speedily make sure we have uh, time for everything today. All right, I have no pertinent disclosures. Um, this is the this is the outline of what we'll be discussing today. Give me one moment to adjust here. Um, I do want to point out the primary uh, focus this morning will be on the acute management of knee dislocations uh, with definitive management in mind, but to that aim, I will be uh, briefly discussing uh, some of the essential aspects of definitive fixation as well. We'll start with the case today. It's a 22-year-old female. She's 5'2", 178 pounds. Um, she was just struck by a car at an unknown speed. This occurred around 1 p.m. The console came in around 4 p.m. Uh, I was consulted for right hip dislocation, had this AP of the pelvis, as you see here. Uh, I, I promptly go to see the patient for the consult um, while she's in the CT scanner. I see a right leg that's shortened and internally rotated and a cold right foot with no palpable pulses and a physical exam, which looks much like this. See, there's no audio on this, that's okay. There's a, as you see, it's a very gross uh, knee exam to assess for uh, knee stability. As you can obviously, it's a grossly unstable knee. A little bit later, the uh, spot film of the right knee from the trauma bay comes in as well, which shows uh, this AP of the tibia and the fibula, but uh, clearly an oblique of the femur showing a grossly um, unstable knee and a motor ligament injury. A little bit of foreshadow here. This is going to be a knee that's going down uh, the ugly pathway, as we'll discuss. So traumatic knee dislocations are relatively rare. They account for 0.02% of all musculoskeletal injuries. Uh, the instance is likely much higher due to 50% of them uh, self-reducing and commonly leading to misdiagnoses. Uh, they're typically due to a high energy mechanism, as you can tell by the fact that 15% to 35% of them are open. However, this uh, demographic is also shifting where there's an uh, increasing incidence of low energy mechanism, which we'll discuss a little bit later. They also occur with concomitant injuries such as neurovascular injuries. Um, uh, for example, uh, injury to the uh, common perineal nerve is going to be the most common, often overlooked, I would say. Um, CPN injuries, the CPN is uh, tethered by both the fibular neck and the fibrous arches of the intramuscular septum, uh, which create anchor points and, and make it uh, very susceptible to injury. Um, these are important because there's a very poor prognosis for neurologic injury in these patients. 21% um, will have full recovery, 29% with a partial recovery, but 50% of these patients will have no meaningful recovery of motor or sensory exam, uh, uh, function. And lastly, there's parotechal soft tissue injuries, such as meniscal injuries and chondral injuries associated with these in 48 to 55% of knee dislocations. Uh, classification sets of systems, there's been advancing classification systems throughout time with the goal of having uh, improved clinical utility. I know we're not big on classification systems here. I think what's most important uh, when you try to classify these knees is whether the knee is stable or unstable and is it acute or chronic in the literature. Chronic is anything beyond three weeks. Uh, knee biomechanics, to simplify, you can think of the knee biomechanics in three planes of range of motion. You have the axial, internal, and external rotation, the restraints are uh, posterior oblique ligament and the superficial MCL for internal rotation, posterior lateral corner for external rotation. In the satchel plane, you have anterior and posterior translation uh, restrained by the ACL and PCL respectively. And then on the coronal plane, you have varus and valgus, which are restrained by the uh, LCL and the MCL respectively. I do want to take a little bit of a closer look at the knee biomechanics of the posterior oblique ligament. It's a very important ligament for stability that I think is not discussed very often. Um, it, again, it's a, uh, important for restraint for internal rotation from zero to 30 degrees of, of knee flexion. Beyond that time, the superficial MCO takes a bigger role. It's also a secondary strength for valgus and also a secondary strength for uh, external rotation. Um, it's located in the posterior medial uh, corner as well, and it can be tested with uh, a valgus stress test. 
Again, discussing neurovascular compromise, there's fibrous tethering of the pelvic teal artery on either side of the knee, proximally at the adductor hiatus and distally at the soleus arch. Um, it also has close proximity to the joint capsule and there's only a, a very thin uh, strand of fat at that area, which makes it susceptible to injury um, with shear injuries, secondary high energy forces. And again, like I said, vascular injury is all typically high energy traumas, but the dem demographic with increasing obesity is leading to this, some studies indicating injury of the vascular injury and up to 50% of cohorts um, at ultra low energy uh, uh, injuries um, as a result of this and also high nerve vascular as much as 8.2 to 40% um, of nerve injury. So we'll discuss this a bit more as well, but uh, it's important to know that nerve injuries, especially to the CPN is more common in, in PLC injuries. Um, as well. So on the initial exam, when you see these patients, number one thing you want to look for is a pulse. That's 79% sensitivity, 91% specificity uh, for vascular injury. And next thing you want to do is check and make sure that the knee is reduced. Um, if it's irreducible, you want to go to the OR. And if there's vascular injury, you also want to expediently go to the OR. This is one of the few orthopedic emergencies. This paper by Green uh, and Allen that showed that if the vascular, is, um, vascular injury is repaired within eight hours, the risk of uh, amputation is simply around 11% versus over eight hours amputation rate is as high as 86%. So this is something that if you see, can't wait overnight, you need to um, let the vascular team know, and let the team know to get things moving as quickly as possible. Um, ABIs should also always be done on the on knee dislocation. Um, you, may, uh, you heard the sensitivity for a pulse, but we do look at ABIs for threshold 90%, the sensitivity specificity, and the um, positive predictive value is approaching 100%. Uh, so you always want to do these and of course you'll do a motor sensation exam. I have a video which I'm 100% sure is not going to work, but um, it shows the method for reduction of a knee um, in a neurovascularly intact patient, relatively young, good patient characteristics. All these things are consistent with what we would discuss to be as good characteristics. Uh, we can watch that video later. Again, it's just showing the reduction technique. It shows gentle inline traction, bringing the knee into extension. Uh, you shouldn't need to do any manual pressure, even if it's supposed to be medial posterior lateral dislocation. You just do gentle inline traction. Um, definitely don't want to push through the popliteal fossa. All these things could increase the risk for iatrogenic and neurovascular injury. Uh, if you're using excessive force, if there's obvious joint asymmetry, or if you see something called a dimple sign, which is seen in these pictures here, um, that's a sign that the medial femoral condyle is actually buttonholed through the medial joint capsule and is actually pinching on the MCL and has become entrapped and pulling into the joint. Um, these are, again, signs that you're going down the ugly pathway with potentially an irreducible knee and need to go to the OR to reduce it. Knee stability exam, clearly very important. A lot of times limited by patient comfort, but you can always do a gross physical exam, much like I did in the video, looking at the Lachman, anterior posterior drawer, various valgus stress, posterior sag, more in-depth exam maneuvers such as pivot shift and dial test potentially be done under anesthesia, but otherwise won't be tolerated very well by the patient. It's important to know that the most common ligament um, mix that's usually involved in this are bicruciate and MCO injuries, followed by bicruciate and posterior lateral corner, but can't assume that all these are the same, need to do a good exam, and also I know that tendon injuries can be associated with it, however the instance of these is not well known. There's a lot of debate over the treatment, acute versus definitive, acutely, whether it's X-fix, splint, knee mobilizer, definitive, early versus delayed, and others, which I'll briefly touch on. Um, thing I, things I think that the literature does support pretty strongly is that operative fixation results in improved functional outcomes versus non-operative management, just about all patients with a few exceptions, which I will go over. And if the knee is stable, you should opt for a knee mobilizer over a splint due to the fact that these vascular injuries can be missed and patients will need to be observed and monitored, especially over the next 24 hours to assess for any development of compartment syndrome or, or vascular injury. And it's harder to do that if you have a long splint on. Talking about vascular compromise, I think most of you know that we typically, uh, our order of operations is that the vascular team repair uh, with a bypass graft first, and then we protect it with an X-fix. Um, issues with this is the fact that uh, the vascular team is then working with a, a limb that is length unstable, and they have to essentially guess at what their length of their graft should be. If it's too long, it leads to redundancy and stasis, plotication of the graft. I actually saw this happen on my uh, vascular surgery rotation. And if it's too short, uh, once we do set the length of the X-fix, then it can lead to graft rupture or stress on the graft. So it's important to be in close communication with them um, when saying the length of the graft with how much length you need. Um, a question always in mind is, what does this acute treatment, how does this affect outcomes of the, of the, in the long term? There was a study um, out of Mayo a few years ago with, um, it looks like our very own Nick Johnson, <laughs> no life and sports research. Um, that looked at this and found that those with uh, uh, vascular artery injury uh, actually had worse uh, out functional outcomes with their knees um, later on down the road. 
But if we've been listening to what I've been saying this morning, one might think that there may be some confounding factors with this. Obviously, those with best vascular injury are more likely to be polytrauma patients, have high energy trauma, and therefore the polytraumas might be factoring into this. Well, the same group out of Mayo a year later thought about this as well, and they did actually look and saw that these patients um, that had vascular injuries, uh, what actually affected their knee outcomes was actually concomitant injuries and psychosocial factors rather than the vascular artery injury itself or um, x fix placement or otherwise. So it's important, again, to think about these patients, these <coughs> complex polytrauma patients uh, most commonly. External fixations, briefly going to discuss on this, um, but originally um, x fix were stainless steel. They had delta ferrite, which uh, were stronger. They res resisted stress and corrosion and cracking. Um, however, this led to ferromagnetism inability to get MRIs. The newer devices these days are typically made out of titanium, carbonium, Kevlar, and other fancy uh, materials that don't have as much ferromagnetism but keep their strength. So once you put on the X-Fix, you think about acute uh, surgical intervention. Uh, in the literature, it's defined about three weeks, and before this time, it's typically formed open. Our, ex our expert uh, experience says us that actually joint capsule repair is about two weeks. So anytime beyond about two weeks, you can do arthroscopic repair. Yeah, before this time, though, you think about open. You use allograft or autograft. Um, you do a stage repair, but the approach depends on which uh, which ligaments are injured. Um, so all you need to do is check your MRI. If you have no way, you need a medial approach or a lateral approach. And here is really what lies the issue. While patients are in main, whether they're inpatient, obviously, when you want to get the, this imaging. Um, but in unstable knee with an X-fix, a lot of times it precludes MRI due to uh, uh, theoretical fears of injuries of loosening or migration of the X-fix or heating, uh, which may harm the patient. But as we discussed, the ferromagnetism in these new devices with new metal is uh, really minimal, uh, if any. So it's important to realize these patients are high trauma patients, or uh, so high energy trauma patients that will need MRIs for other things, whether it's C-spine, brain, let alone their knee. Um, but still, we have refused by MRI techs um, commonly to do this. So when you think about potential alternatives, for example, stress radiographs, there's been a literature about that. This is a technique paper here out of Brazil, which shows um, the very simple uh, technique for stress radiographs. You just need to get the polytrauma patient up. You get them stand on one leg, have one foot on this bench, have them put varying degrees of weight on here, have the radiologist uh, take perfect laterals of the knee, as you see here, and it'll be able to give us a functional exam for the translation of that tibia. Um, I know I see a few people smiling because if you have worked at CMC Maine and know our trauma population, this is simply not possible and not very realistic. So yes, stress radiographs are, the are uh, <coughs> conceptually simple, they're low cost, they give us a functional assessment. However, they're not very realistic um, in our trauma population and in our institution. And they also, on top of all that, don't show us what we actually need to see in terms of other soft tissue injuries, meniscus and contra injuries that are important for treatment. So. Um, you know, going back to MRI, which is it's a necessary step here. Um, in 2014, the FDA uh, recategorized these to look at MRI compatible, safe, conditional, and unsafe. The XFIX set we use, which is the Cynthia's large XFIX set, actually used to be MRI safe, but with this recategorization, was changed to MRI conditional. I could have an entire grand round about the compatibility of XFIXs with the MRIs, but to make a long story short, just want to point out that the MRI conditions for the Cynthia's large XFIX to be used safely are met at CMC Maine. Um, and it would be helpful to have a protocol um, in order to uh, assure this. Um, I do want to quickly mention some research, um, some clinical research that uh, supports this. This is a paper presented in 2016 at OTA. They looked at, it was a retrospective polycenter um, multiple center analysis where they looked at 1,444 patients, 72 X fixes that entered the MRI board for uh, MRIs on the knee uh, or other aspect that had a uh, X-Fix on it. Seven of these were sent these X-Fixes. They used both 3 and 1.5 tests, the MRIs, and they found zero cases of catastrophic failure, zero reported cases of patient discomfort, zero reported cases of thermal injury from heating um, heating of the pins. 58 of these, uh, they, 58 other instances where the MRI was in the room for a C-spine or otherwise, and again, zero cases of complications. Um, something to point out is that all of these patients were awake and alert and able to respond and communicate with the MRI tech uh, conditions, which I think should be replicated for any protocol that we do have in Maine as well. So getting back to having your x skin the MRI, going to late surgical, surgical intervention, which could be anywhere two or three weeks afterwards. If you do arthroscopic intervention, typically repair this time, it's too much scarring of the ligaments to do, so typically it's opted for reconstruction. And there's also options for um, nerve injuries such as, such as tendon transfers and otherwise. 
Now, the sequence of ligament reconstruction is always up for debate. It's very controversial because there's no tissue size that define tibial femoral reduction, objectively prior to evaluating um, uh, any given sequence. So if a, if a knee reduction is off and not objectively reduced by the time you start, um, then it could throw off your results for the rest of the paper and it's really or rest of the study and really tensioning what's most important here. So um, how you know how much tension if you're all uh, tensioning at a moving target is a very difficult part. But for example, um, you know, just for the sake of example here, the paper I looked at, so Sims et al, really looked at reducing and fixing the PCL first, trying to get the knee in a tunnel position, then the ACLs, collaterals, and there's multiple different <laughs> methods for PLC um, reconstruction. Now, when thinking about definitive fixation, it's always important to look at patient factors. Um, big one is obesity. As I said, it's a large and growing demographic um, that is suffering from uh, knee dislocations. Um, studies show the operative times are longer, the procedure is more difficult. However, they do still have improved functional outcomes with definitive fixation, multi ligament repair. Other things to think about are age, other comorbidities, pre existing conditions, and baseline function <laughs> of your patient. So getting down to an algorithm for everybody, the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to knee dislocations, the good, they're reducible, stable, favorable patient characteristics. The bad, they're reducible, but they're unstable, and they have favorable patient characteristics. And the ugly, they're irreducible and or unstable, they have vascular compromise, and they have unfavorable patient characteristics. There's still options for these patients. Um, if they have to have long-term mobilization, but you don't want the knee to get stiff, you can do things like a hinge external fixation. Um, and acute hinge uh, TKA and arthroplasty is becoming a, a growing option for these patients as well. Um, these patients are ones that typically have unstable injury. They probably have a pre-existing arthritis, advanced age, typically 50s or older, and they may be unlikely to comply with restrictions or precautions after ligamentous reconstruction. In this case study, is a 54-year-old male um, who had a chronic knee dislocation 54 years back that unsuccessfully um, it was unsuccessfully reduced, and he was a farmer, continued to go through manual labor during this entire time. I think this is the definition of someone who's going to be unlikely to comply with restrictions and precautions. Um, this is his knee on, on exam when he came in. This was his x-rays. I think very clearly we're looking at something that's going down the ugly pathway. It's going to be difficult to fix. He got an acute TKA and actually had a great functional, um, functional outcome. Another one is going to be, oh, here we go. Uh, this 18-year-old uh, female who had a knee dislocation for ultra-low mechanism injury, slipped and fell at home on a wet spot, um, had this chronic injury since September. As you see the soft tissue envelope there, hard to make out the anatomy, but obviously much like we need to uh, injury, again, going down the ugly pathway with this patient. So create an algorithm. I'll simplify this a bit for everyone. Uh, the good, going down, always want to do ACLS for all these patients. 27% of them are going to have life-threatening injuries associated with it. Um, you do a physical exam, including ABIs, reduce it. These patients are going to be attacked, stable, put on knee mobilizer. Based on the patient characteristics, we're going to go to definitive fixation. The bad, they're going, to, they're going to be vascular intact, have an unstable knee. You want to apply an X fix, get MRI based on patient characteristics, um, have definitive fixation. And then for the ugly, you want to try to reduce it. You're going to be traveling to the OR in one way or another, either because it's irreducible or um, they have vascular compromise. If there's vascular compromise, do a repair likely prophylactic fasciotomies, X-fix, MRI, and then definitive fixation. So hopefully that simplifies that and is helpful for um, the residents. So takeaway points, you wanna have a prompt exam, diagnosis and reduction. Um, always wanna check neurovascular status and get the vascular repair within eight hours. Always do ABIs and a CTM runoff if there's any question here. You wanna achieve uh, Q-stability with either knee mobilizer or X-fix. Um, the literature does support MRI with the X-fix and the setup that we have over at Maine. And definitive treatment is gonna be um, provide the best outcome with a few exceptions as we've discussed. So uh, our case, 22 year old female, um, Peach versus Otto, she had a vascular injury. She got into the OR and was repaired by Vassar by about 7 p.m. So that's about six hours from injury, which is just within this eight hour window. Um, she was the definition of a high energy polytrauma patient. She had a right hip fracture dislocation, right knee dislocation, popliteal artery injury, pelvic ring injury, bimolar ankle fracture, tibia fracture, clavicle fracture, potentially another much ligament knee injury. Um, she did get a vascular repair. We put on an X-fix. She had pelvic X-fix and prophylactic fasciotomies. Um, and last I looked a few days ago, she was still getting definitive fixation um, over in Maine. So we discussed the good, the bad, the ugly diagnostic imaging here in MRI, even with the X-fixes, um, would be beneficial for a agreed upon protocol to be developed so that we can get this done for these patients. And again, most ligament reconstruction um, is ideal for uh, definitive treatment of, of almost all patients. So I just want to thank everyone, Dr. Shu, Dr. Seymour, Dr. Paisecki, Dr. Otero, Dr. Norman, Dr. Sossman, everyone who was able and willing to um, look through my slides, go over with me. Really appreciate you all. 
um, and of course, my class is my bibliography, um, and I'm happy to take any questions. So, Rob, a good talk of acute management here, and, and that's one of the most important things for us here at our center. Um, I would ask you a question. How many of these do we get a year? Um, I, when I was at Shock Trauma, we had 60 a year. When I was at Duke, we had about less than half of that, 20 to 30. How many do we get here at CMC? You know, I don't know the, ex the exact number, but I know it's very common. I know I saw, I was on Trauma in November, December, typically lower um, uh, volume months. I think I saw three just in those two months, just me, obviously. So I think it waxed and wanes a bit. Three in two months? No, no, three. Three. Three, three. <laughs> three <laughs> personally. Three would be a lot, and I have a lot of examples. But okay, so, no so probably, um, we're probably, yeah, okay. So we're probably seeing 40 a year or something like that. Maybe. Yeah, I, and I would say the instance is increasing for just the ultra low energy, the slip and falls and obese population sure. is growing. Dr. might be able to answer that a little bit better in terms of the total volume that we see, um, but it's, it's definitely growing. Well, uh, next question for you. When you look at these, different forms that need dislocation, and we classify it by where the tibia lands relative to the femur. Mm -hmm. What um, what are the the forms of knee dislocation that have the higher incidence of vascular injury? Do you know that? So typically extension injuries is the ones that have the most. So it would still be a post dislocation of, of the tibia. Whether it's medial or lateral, I didn't see anything in the literature that supported one, one way or another. So but definitely extension would be anterior, right? Correct. For, uh, well, I'm not sure in terms of where the tibia lands. I just know that in terms of mechanisms, extension, hyperextension mechanism, where there's the highest vascular injury. That would be anterior. Yeah. So the dashboard injury is a posterior. That's where the knee flex. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think it's important is because if you get an anterior knee dislocation, it's going to be a stretch injury on the artery. Mm -hmm. And so they're more commonly going to get an entomal flap, which is generally benign, but sometimes the, the, the flap can flip. Yeah. So that's why it's important to follow those serial ABIs even if they have a normal exam at the beginning. Whereas a posterior dislocation is most commonly going to be a transection mm -hmm. if it's going to be a vascular injury. Yeah. So just keep that in mind when you're seeing these different forms that they have different types. Absolutely. The next question that comes into mind when you're a, a sports medicine surgeon, you're trying to do these reconstructions is what's the timing of the reconstruction relative to a vascular injury. Let's say that um, Frank Arca has got to take them up and they got to do a pop to a bypass into a sap in Spain. How soon after that can you put a tourniquet up to do your knee, knee dislocation mm -hmm. um, surgery? What What do you think the answer to that is? Literally says about about six weeks. Yeah, typically. And that was an article we did at Shock Trauma. So it might be that it could be sooner than that, but I know at six weeks it's okay because we've we've done over a hundred of them since that time where they've had a vascular reconstruction and had a tourniquet and didn't have a negative sequela. But so anyway, that's that's a question that's commonly answered. The next thing that you come to is when do you use a fixer? And what I, what I would say is I would caution you not just to slam a fixer on every patient because that creates another obstacle to get into the OR for the definitive surgery. Because if I see a patient in the clinic, like one that's getting ready to come to me that's in low orbit now, you know, that'll require two stages because now we got to go to the OR, take the fixer off, examine the patient, get their motion back, 